Welcome to the Why God Why podcast. This is a podcast brought to you by Browncroft Community Church. We are responding to the questions that you don't feel comfortable asking in church. We are here with author and pastor. Um, he's just been a great follow. His name's Steve Carter. Um, and the question that we're asking, why do I do the things I hate? Aaron. What do you think about this question? I think it's a great question. And by the way, I'm just really excited about this conversation. Thanks uh, so much for um, putting it together. And Steve, thanks so much for being on here with us. Yeah, no, it's a it's a great question. I think it's something that a lot of people struggle with. I mean, obviously we know that. <laughs> we know it's been struggled with for ever since people have been people. So I'm um, excited to talk some more about it. Awesome. Well, Steve, let's just kind of jump right in. For the listeners that don't know who you are, why don't you just share a little bit about your story, where you grew up, and how you are where you are right now. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks so much for having me on. I love what you guys are about, and I love that you are just um, unafraid to go after the hard questions. I think that's what our our world needs, Um, people who can just lean in. Um, I, I grew up in Southern California. Uh, my parents weren't people who went to church, but I was in one of those schools, um, that had a church connected to it. And, you know, and I, in seventh grade, um, there were some juniors in high school. Um, their names were Dominic and Nathan, uh, but they went by the name dominate, which is just awesome. And, uh, those two just were the first Christians I ever wanted to really be I didn't I didn't really understand what a Christian was but I just they were leaders that like sports they were fun I just wanted to be them and one day Dominic as a junior came up to me as a seventh grader and said hey Carter and I didn't even know he knew who I was he said you want to learn how to dominate life and to this day it was it's like one of the best questions anybody's ever asked me mm-hmm. And he and Nathan started discipling me and it just changed the trajectory of my life. And so I often, uh, whenever anybody asked me, uh, where did, how did I get to where I am? Um, was because two juniors, uh, took a risk and invited me and, uh, started to take me to in and out. And I know y'all are on the East coast. You probably haven't had an in and out burger, but I'll tell you what, oh, it's, I've experienced where the it. it's good. Glory of, <laughs> oh, you know, it's, oh, yeah. it's, it's where the Shekinah glory of the Lord descends in burgerly form <laughs> and, uh, the best conversations happen there. And, um, yeah. And so I just, I've, I've been so blessed because of the women and men that God have put in my life who have served as mentors and guides and coaches. Um, and so from Dominic to, um, various pastors around the country, um, God has just opened doors where they saw a gift in me that I didn't honestly see in myself, but I trusted them more than I trusted my own doubts, um, about myself and, and calling. And so, um, have been at a, a church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I was at Rock Harbor in um, Southern California. Most recently was, um, working at Willow Creek community church, uh, for about seven years and was like in their succession kind of hand off and um, the wheels kind of came off there um, just due to some allegations and stories that came forward um, with my mentor and I just felt like it wasn't being handled appropriately so I, I took a step to the side and said I, I, I got to stand with the women but I, I ended up transitioning off and, and now I have feel this deep deep calling to really help people understand why they do what they do but also to train preachers. And I've been working with a lot of pastors around the country with a ministry called Craft and Character, helping people get better at the craft of communication, but ensuring that their character is leading the way. I preach most every weekend at a church around the country. And then um, I know you've had my friend Sam Macho on the podcast, and Sam's one of my dear friends. Um, but uh, we, we do a, a sports podcast together called The Home Team. Steve, that's awesome, and that's a great setup. Um, you know, so we're having you on talking about uh, the book, uh, the the thing beneath the thing. Um, you've kind of hinted at it. Um, we wish we could write books about this in good times, and it's been a, a difficult couple of years for you personally. I guess um, as we kind of frame this question, why do I do the things that I hate? You know, just help us understand the impetus to this book, kind of your personal journey and your personal experience on why would even someone write a book like this, especially all that you've gone through? Yeah, well, I mean, I I think nobody wakes up one day and says, today's the day. Today's the day I'm gonna train wreck my life. You know, today's the day that I'm gonna self-sabotage all the good that God has put before me. Today's the day that 
I am going to watch my integrity come crumbling down. Like this is, doesn't happen, but somehow almost like surfing out in the Pacific ocean and you get kind of caught in this current where you just slowly start to drift, uh, from true North or drift from the center. And it happens. And so I've just been fascinated. And this this was pre Willow stuff. I, I was fascinated by as people would come in my office and they would share with me the realities of their life. And I found myself asking the question, like, why do people do what they do? And more importantly, like, why do I do what I do? And if anybody ever wrestles with just the morning after, like, why did I say that? Why did I do that? Why did I go there? Why did I buy that? Why, why did I, why did I put that into my system? And why did I stew on that? Um, you're in good company because the apostle Paul wrestled with this, you know, the, the thing I want to do, I do not do, uh, the good I want to do, I do not do, but the thing I hate, I do. So this is, this is the guy who wrote the majority of the New Testament and he's, he's wrestling with why do I do the thing I hate? Um, and so I, I think there's gotta be reasons and I, I'm, I'm just kind of, maybe it's the, the, the pastor in me, maybe it's the leader in me, maybe it's just the, the curiosity that I have, but I don't want to just keep waking up going, ah, I just did it again. Hmm. That's okay. Thanks. Thanks be, thanks be to God for grace and just keep doing what I'm doing. Like. I think the invitation is to live lives that are whole, holy, and spiritually healthy. And and then I think when you've been up close and you've seen train wrecks, whether in a family system, whether in a church family system, whether with friendships, um, you just sit there and you go like, ah, oh, it just breaks my heart because of the collateral damage. And I just, I, for me, I think the pastoral side is how can I help straight from God's word, make this applicable, helpful to encourage people to understand the stakes, but understand the beauty of what sanctifying grace is all about. Well, uh, Steve, that, I mean, there's so much good stuff in there to dig into. Um, wow. Um, I was struck even actually like right at the beginning, you talked about you were you were asking these questions of yourself. Um, we are in good company because even, you know, back to the Apostle Paul and of course many other people have asked these questions. But I actually am wondering, do you think a lot of people even ask the question in the first place? Like is that how do you, is that an issue by itself? And then how do you how do you even get to that step in the first place? And and maybe also what are the consequences for not doing that? What what's been your experience on that? Yeah, great question. I you know I honestly think that the majority of people ask the question, um, and I, I think you know it, it could be when you're washing your face and you went home with that person that you wish you didn't, and maybe you're far from God, maybe you have uh, been going to church, but you you're like, ah, why did I do this? Um, I think we've had moments where we replay that conversation with the spouse. And you're like, why do I get so defensive? Um, and I think, I think, you know, in the last 10 years, we've found ourselves learning more about emotional intelligence, maybe not necessarily knowing how to access it or the self contempt that we all feel at times. Like, ah, oh, man, I'm so terrible. Like I did this again. We not, we might not be asking the question per se, but we're feeling the results or the ache, the ache of, ah, I did it again. Or man, he was right about saying those, those words about me. And it's all based in shame. So I think just to flip it and start to, to move out of shame and move to a place of curiosity, um, I think is, is going to lead towards health and wholeness. And I do, I, I do believe like that there's something in, in our life where for many of us, we're, we're like, why do they seem to make better decisions than me? Mm -hmm. Why in the moment am I, am I just, just getting amped or shutting down? Why, what, what's happening? And I think some people don't know how to access the real point. And that's at the heart of the book is trying to help people access why we do what we do and why we do the things we hate. And I think this book is going to be a guide to help people discover it 
but more intentionally give people the keys and the clues straight from God's word, how to begin to move forward. And I think, you know, if Ecclesiastes 3 is correct, that God has put eternity in our hearts. That's a longing for health. That's a longing for peace. That's a longing for freedom. We all have this, whether we're close to God or far from God, this longing of going, ah, oh, this, this, it should be easier than this. It should be sweeter than this. It should be better for, than this. Why then is it this way? And why is it this way in me? That's what I'm trying to get after. So uh, you're bringing up some things that are just super complicated. So I, I think if I was to pull and you know, maybe our audience would tell us, uh, the majority of people would say, most people are good at heart, but we've lived through a year where like if I voted a different way or if I disagreed on this issue, I assume the worst. And then in the Bible, we have this odd tension of, you know, this, you know, $20 theological word sin. And we also depravity, but we're also created in God's image. So I, I guess like it's funny where when the culture has a weird tension and so does Christianity, how do you resolve we're created good, created sinful, well, not created sinful, but we we're born into sin, you know, we're born into brokenness. You know, how do you kind of navigate that? Because, you know, Aaron's, you know, a really good guy, um, but I, I Thanks, think, I, I love I it. I appreciate it. Yeah. But he Thank and I, <laughs> he and I might, you know, I might think I'm super terrible, he might think he's super good, and there's just this odd continuum. How do you navigate all of that personally and for other relationships? Okay, so let's bring it back to the, the biblical narrative. Um, like a great play, the Bible has, in my opinion, five acts. So the Bible begins with the creation story, and God created everything good. So he created good. So that's where you have to start with. I start with Peter and Aaron looking for the good. The truth is, though, you're right. Genesis 3, where, where the majority of people begin their Bible. They say they begin in Genesis 1. The majority of people, by the way that they label and create narratives about people, they believe that their Bible begins in Genesis 3, and they've just ripped out chapters 1 and 2. Hmm. So you fall is legit. The fall happened. It's a story where it shook everything up. Now, what's amazing is God actually begins this redemptive movement, and he, and he begins with this the story of a man who's wrestling um, with an angel and this 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 wrestling match every other time that this man had been asked what your name is he's lied he's deceived he is pretended to be somebody he wasn't and finally for the first time that we have recorded in scripture he says my name is Jacob I am a deceiver I am Jacob I am this guy and the angel goes no you're not your new name is Israel which means to struggle with God to struggle with self and others and to overcome. So the third act is struggle. So like you have you have good creation, fall sin, you have Israel struggle, then obviously you have the cross redemption and then you have this the you know the re the restoration like the church, the holy spirit kind of second part of like new testament and on acts and on. So these are the five acts. Every every environment I walk into I believe that God's presence is there. And if God's presence is there, then it's brimming with redemptive potential. And I'm looking, whether I'm at you know a coffee shop, I'm looking for the good. And I'm hoping that someone can actually share with me their story. Because the truth is, we were born into family systems. Systems of narcissism, systems of generational brokenness, systems of pain, systems of, of just absolute struggle. And, and then we, we find ourselves as humans trying to figure out our way. So, for instance, my biological father, um, my, my name when I was born was Stephen Charles Bourne. The story I was told was that my biological father bailed pretty early. My mom remarries. I get adopted. That, that's, that was like part of my story. And what did I struggle with for much of my life was like, I better perform and achieve because people are actually going to leave me. Mm. Oh. What's amazing is when I started to understand the gospel and the gospel, like as Dominic started to share with me is how God tried to get closer and closer to me, that this father wanted to get closer and closer to me. 
When you flip through the New Testament, you see the story of the death, burial, resurrection, and the ways that Paul is using various metaphors to speak to the struggle and to the fall and to the pain. So, so I say a lot to go, uh, for me, I'm always just looking for the good. And I understand that there is brokenness. There is pain. There is struggle. Um, and I, I look at this and I go, I'm more curious is, is what was handed to that person that they're left having to be responsible to figure out if they were a child of an alcoholic, if they were a child of a narcissistic parent, if they went through some form of physical, verbal, or sexual, or spiritual abuse. Like, mm. they're left now with this struggle to have to work through, and they're probably making decisions trying to figure it out. Sometimes those decisions lead to more health and wholeness, redemption and restoration. Sometimes they lead to more brokenness. But they're still, if I cut away all the dead pieces, they're still created in that Imago Dei, the image of God. So there's still goodness there. And so if you're listening and you're like, man, I think I have train wrecked my life. You still were created in the image of God. Mm. There's still profound good. And like me, definitely like Peter, um, maybe not so much like Andrew, um, we, we, we all are in process. And obviously I'm joking with you, Peter. But like the truth <laughs> is, like if you look at Ruth Bell Graham's tombstone, have you ever seen her tombstone, Billy Graham's wife? No. It says her name. It says the date of birth, the day she passes. And then it simply says, construction completed. Thanks for your patience. Because she understood she was a piece of work. She was in process, just like the three of us. So last thing I'll say, because I can preach all day. Like the truth is like, I'm always looking for those, like where are we at? What act are we at in this person's life? And we're all in process and we'll never fully arrive this side of heaven. So let's be kind to ourselves. Let's lean in. Let's stay curious and let's not expect so much greatness and success. Let's just fight to be a little bit more healthier and a little bit more whole and do the harder right um, and watch and see what grace and God and his spirit can do in us and through us and with us and for us. So that's, uh, let me just follow up a little bit on that. Um, I, I, uh, I love how you're, you're talking about, um, seeing people for who they really are and, 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 and what God's plan is for them. And how do we, how do we help them? How do we help each other really? Because we are them <laughs> really. Um, you talk, I, 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 you know, um, haven't had the privilege of reading the whole book yet, but I got a little summary of it. And, um, I'm, you know, I noticed that in there, there, you had several main points. Um, one of them was about hideouts. Um, and I, it sounds to me like you're talking about hideouts being the place where you go to escape the pain of your story. Um, can you tell me a little bit more, more about that? And also the reason why I'm asking is because it sounds to me like you're, you're talking about getting in there to where people are hiding out and helping them get out of there um, so that they can face whatever the pain is, whatever the issue is. How do you do that to help somebody? Quite frankly, how do you do that to help yourself? Like, how do I do that to help myself? Um, how do I know when I have a, a hideout and how do I, how do I get out of it? Yeah, great question. So back it all the way up. And I would say one, one thought would be, we don't just necessarily just go to a hideout. Something caused me to run to that. This is where Paul's wrestling with. The, why do I do the thing I hate? Like I'm going out to soothe in some capacity, um, but something caused that. That's the piece that I became fascinated by is realizing is we all get triggered multiple times a day. And the trigger and thing beneath the thing, thing is an acronym. So it goes triggers, hideouts, insecurities, narratives, and then lastly, grace. But when we get triggered, I realized sitting with people for 20 years in ministry that many people tended to go to one of four places and oftentimes multiple places. But the triggers was the setup that set us off. It was all of that energy, the desire, like I need to escape this feeling. And for many of us, just like in Genesis three, when the man and the woman took of the fruit, you know, and, and the wife passed it over to the man, the man was like free food and he eats it. And like all of a sudden they feel that sense of shame. So what do they do? They make clothes. And then what do they do when they hear God walking in the garden, the cool of the day, they hide. It's the first game of hide and seek in the scriptures and God's calling out to them. 
The truth is we all have hideouts. It's the places, like you said, that we go to escape the pain of our story. And so the, the truth is some of it's just more socially acceptable. Hmm. And it's socially acceptable to rack up credit card debt, to hmm. buy yourself out of that pain. It's socially acceptable to binge watch an entire season of Ted Lasso. And I'm not even mad at that. That's a smart play. But like there, there, there is a, there is, there is like socially acceptable. We watched during COVID, which was like the great revealer of our day, alcohol sales off the charts, pornography off the charts, opioids off the charts. Like we saw things that we re realized that we all had unhealthy escapes and maybe it wasn't one glass of wine but it was a bottle of wine and we were soothing that mm -hmm. is the hideout so the question i'm always trying to ask people is hey what triggers you what triggers you and where do you tend to go to soothe and just just think about this biblically moses is up on the mountain and the people are like where's moses where's moses and they're hearing thunder and they're seeing smoke and they're like, Aaron, this is not good. Like we, we can't hear from them. Seriously. Can you please help us out? We don't know. So what do they do? They take all of the gold that they had been given and, and like they need a place to put their anxiety. So they shape and form an idol that they can cast all of their worry on. This is what Amazon has been brilliant at with the one click button. So we do this every day. And by the time we realize like, why am I buying another lawn gnome? I don't need a lawn gnome. Like we can't return it because it's already been delivered because they're so quick with this. So all I'm saying is what are the places that we have basically believed this can hold my anxiety, my shame, my pain, my worry. Last thing I'll say is John Orberg said this once. He said, hey, running to a bottle will give you a fleeting moment of peace, but it will not make you a person of peace. And what I'm trying to get at is all of these little escapes, yeah, they're going to give you a fleeting moment of peace and escape and release. They're just not going to make you a person of peace. And this is, this is the deeper, more whole question that I think the scriptures invite us into. Wow. Um, that's just, that's just a lot. Um, you know, so, <laughs> so sorry. I, oh, I'm well, so no, no, sorry. no, no, no. It, 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 it's a good, a lot. <laughs> I, I think some of our listeners are going to need to click pause. Um, and just because I, I'm relating to it. Um, I just want to shift our attention a little bit if it, if it's okay. So I imagine our listeners are really resonating with, you know, why do I do the things I, I hate? I, I agree with you that there's a semblance of, we look back into our day. Um, one of the things I'm concerned with with our listeners, here's the deal, as a pastor, I've royally failed people. Um, you know, if we weren't recording right now, there's situations that I would totally take back as a spiritual leader. Um, and I'm cognizant of everything that's happened, just the number of spiritual leaders that have fell where I'm sensitive and where I'm, you know, just I'm my heart for our listeners is there's some listeners that have said, you know what, if Christianity is supposed to be full of grace, full of people of, with integrity, why should I even follow it? If people aren't practicing it, I, I guess, I guess I'm just kind of throwing this to you as a spiritual leader that has kind of walked through a valley like this and, probably have had some conversations. What would you say to that person that, you know, the the leaders, the people that were supposed to be held the most accountable have let people down. And I love this grace for myself, but it's hard for me to reconcile what I see and what I feel with the people that I'm supposed to trust. And so I just want you to respond to our listeners who are really trying to delve into that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, not, gonna, I'm not gonna pretend and, and say it's easy. It's not easy to, to, to have people let you down. It's not, it's not easy when you, um, you know, expect, um, certain realities from people and they can't follow through. Right. Um, but I also think like I've had to really look in the mirror and think to myself, 
why did I put that person on such a pedestal? Mm. I mean, and, and just, just real talk, Peter, like I, I want you to be able to share what you said. If we weren't recording, I, I would, I would say things like that. That for me is part of the problem is like, we don't know how to actually be able to like really chop it up around honesty and humanity. So what ends up happening is certain people get built up to a level that they, they can't be. And the problem is, is they create systems, not you. I'm not saying you, they create systems though. What we're seeing in our world today that they are protected and insulated and almost set apart in a way that it makes it easier and easier for people to go, gosh, they're special. They're holy. They're better. I don't, I don't, I don't actually compete with them. I can't, I'm not even close to them. I mean, the way that they pray, I mean, it seems like they have these stories that with their marriage and their kids and I mean, they're, they're, they're like with all these people, people know them. And again, people are very perceptive. They're just often crappy interpreters of reality. So they perceive something. It's the stories that they create based on their perceptions. And this is why we as leaders have to have to really reframe things in the healthiest ways. So here's all I'd say. I expect people to fail because none of us are perfect. I expect my self to do good things. And I also know I'm far from perfect. And the only way that I know to prevent myself from absolutely train wrecking my integrity and self-sabotage is by doing my work. And the truth is we're all addicts. We all are addicts. We have socially acceptable addictions and socially unacceptable addictions. So even if somebody's on stage, suit and tie, memorized a talk, preaching the pain off the walls, people are getting saved. They need Jesus just as much as I need Jesus and just as much as you need Jesus. I'm not minimizing their gift. They're gifted, but I guarantee you, they are in process. So I've come to realize like, oh, I respect the gift, but I cherish the giver of the gift. And that's God. And I also recognize success will take us places that character can't sustain us. And so the better that I have to be is to simply say, Lord, please let my character lead the way. And man, I'm going to have to keep being honest and human with where I'm wrong. Last thing I'll say on this one, because I might, I might not be answering your question, but like there's something that happens within the church that we say that I was wrong when we say yes to Jesus. And then from that point on, we struggle to admit that we are wrong and we have to be right. What if, what if we actually like actually got progressively better at, admitting that we are not just wrong. Oh my goodness. But I was wronger and more wrong. And I was like really wrong. But what's happened though, is that has gotten so connected to shame that like now I can't admit the places that, man, I, I'm falling short here, I'm falling short in my finances, I'm falling short in my marriage. I'm falling short. Like with this issue of pride and I'm falling short, like, you know, and, and really getting to a point of consent. So like for me in consent, I travel a lot and like, it's, you, you sit down like on a plane and because I have so many miles, I don't buy first class tickets. I just get bumped up. And then all of a sudden they're like, would you like a drink? The person next to me is like, I'll take a Jack and Coke. And I'm like, it's, it's like 8 AM. And I'm like, I can't do that. Or it's like 7 PM. And I realize. I could have one at seven, but I, if I have one at 9 PM, I don't sleep well. And then I just feel like my, my mind is a little bit off and I feel more tempted. So I have to come to a point where I literally have to consent to say, I think I could handle a drink, but it's, it's, it's not the drink. It's what two hours later when I don't sleep well. And when my mind is racing and I'm open to temptation 
is that really what I want to put in my body? So I have to admit my limits, which I, I never was taught to do. So, so part of it is going, I'm There's places in my life that if I don't have consent and actually know my limits, I'm going to, I'm going to train wreck stuff in my story, or I can go, guys, I need help. Guys, like this is the beauty of grace. I can start to do my work. I don't, does this make sense? So I say all that to go, I just don't put that expectation on someone because my counselor says expectations are premeditated resentments. I don't want to premeditate a resentment that that person can't live up to and was never supposed to. I want to respect the gift that God's given them, but cherish, cherish the giver, celebrate the giver, be able to receive from the giver through this vessel. Um, and also recognize I'm an addict and I need to do my work. Yeah. Wow. Wow. That's, there's a lot there too. Wow. I, I that's, uh, I, I don't know if people aren't watching on, if they're listening on the podcast, if they're not watching on YouTube, they, you know, both Peter and I were like, Whoa, <laughs> it's really good. Um, so, uh, I mean, so we, we talked about there, there are definitely, we can all think of examples of people, you know, that are known, um, you know, celebrities in our own worlds one way or another um or even people close to us who have let us down and and on on things like this but i mean because there's someone you could point to uh that has done this well i mean you mentioned ruth ruth graham earlier um on her uh that that strong saying on her on um her 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 tombstone but what about uh is there someone else is there someone that you could point to who who does know their limits well someone that someone could emulate to say like hey that person actually i should pay attention to the what that person is doing again not to put them on the pedestal they can't you know i guess that that could be a that could lead us to a bad cycle here but like who has learned that lesson who has some wisdom in this area that we could look to and uh aaron asked this but we're not looking for a sunday school answer with jesus so i just <laughs> i i know uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we get to use the sunday school answers right i mean that's that's what we get to do yeah 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 oh, we, okay we, all right i was checking i want to make yeah, sure yeah you know what's amazing is if you if you go to if you think about from the business world there was a guy by the name of uh, Jim Collins and he wrote like um, good to great um, and he, he wrote a number of books but one of the the premises of good to great was that there were five levels of leaders level five leader was a very rare kind of leader and I've only been around one of those I believe that I could like pick up legitimately it was like this guy's a level five leader I was with this guy, his name's Mike Volkema. He used to be the CEO of Herman Miller. He followed um, Max Dupree, who wrote Leadership Jazz. But Mike Volkema, I mean, hands down, um, nobody knows him. Uh, but he is, he is, he should be known because he, he is that kind of leader. I asked him, I said, hey, um, how many level five leaders do you find in like Fortune 100, Fortune 500 companies? He's like, very few. He said, there's just so much ego. Um, so much, so much power. Um, level five leaders uh, are the kind of people who who have these values. Um, you know, because so many of us, you know, uh, we know what we want, and then the next question is, how am I going to get it? Um, but very few of us know why. No, you know, in Simon Sinek language, know our compelling why and have the values that we've created based on that why. And I think that's what's hard is the majority of the kind of people I'm talking about, nobody knows. Um, they're, they're pastoring a 400 person church and they're awesome. Like Chad Halliburton. Um, you know, they're, they're, they're people that are just um, not trying to play a game or play a system um, to, to try and reach for more followers and to do something that's, you know, Sermon on the Mount language. If you, if you guys read this or the listeners and reading Matthew five, six or seven, you'll see this phrase again and again, they receive the reward in full. It's like, we're doing something and Jesus is like, oh, they did that. And all they wanted to be was seen. All they wanted to be was known. They received the reward in full. But like, there's another group of people who have such trust in what God wants to do in them and through them and for them. And they're going to, theirs reward will be great in heaven. And I just think, I think that there's fewer people who, who live that way. Um, 
and I would say fewer people who live that way in the limelight. It's just harder. I do think, though, that there are some voices and some people that I do think very highly of. You know, Glenn Packiam, Rich Velotis. Um, I think that there are some voices where just from afar, from what I see, I'm like, man, Daniel Strickland, um, that I just go, gosh, like you, uh, you teach me, you teach me. Um, and, um, so I, I, I'm not saying that they don't exist. They do exist, but it is a, it's a harder thing to walk, um, when there's more cameras and eyes on you, um, and more opportunity that's being dangled in front of your, your, your face. Um, because then all of a sudden it's like, well, don't, don't admit too much. So then all of a sudden it's like, don't admit the wrongs. Like, and I think the better, the, this is why what makes an AA or celebrate recovery meeting so beautiful is because you just get up and you're like, hi, my name's Steve. I'm an alcoholic or hi, my name's Steve. I'm a sinner. Hi, my name's Steve. Um, and again, I, I, I hold intention that I'm both sinner and saint. I'm both beautiful and broken. But I'm not going to side to only one. Both are true, and so is God's goodness and God's grace through His Son. Wow, um, you know, and again, I just appreciate your heart, um, you know, in all of this because I, I think whether you're a leader, you know, in you know the marketplace or in the church, whether you're a follower of Jesus, de-churched, unchurched, I, I think this is super practical. So, I just want to close with two final questions. We'll get to the last one, but. I want to kind of come back to the majority of our listeners. Um, I'm going to go super specific for you to go to super broad, but you know, so you talked about acceptable hideouts. You talked about like acceptable vices. For example, paint me a picture of me really working on and understanding binging a Netflix show. What's that going to do for me in five years? Because, you know, it seems like Christianity talks about just don't do this, don't do that. And you're kind of painting a new vision of what does my life look like captivated by the grace of God in five years if I'm willing to go to the thing beneath the thing? Yeah, that's a great question. So um, during COVID, we've we've always been tried to be pretty intentional with budget. And, you know, we had like a a little bit of a vacation budget and because we couldn't travel uh, we decided to, to to buy a little cabin up in the mountains in Arizona and just thought like hey it saves us from having to deal with 115 degree weather which um, man it that's a that is that's too hot here during the summer so we're, <laughs> we're up in the mountains and um, we're just start demoing this and this 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 little cabin had like good bones, but I mean, drop down ceilings, teal carpet. I mean, they were like blocking all these windows and stuff. And so we just went after it, pulling up carpet, just, just demolishing this thing. And it was kind of crazy. I had this like really, really profound moment. I don't know if you guys have ever experienced this, but like, I don't have them very often, but like something, something like impressed upon me as I was just destroying this drop down ceiling. And all of a sudden the light from these massive windows came in and I just felt like this, this spirit of God say, this is what I'm trying to do in you to let more light, to open you up. Hmm. And I, I, you know, coming out of everything I had walked through at Willow, um, I was like, Oh my goodness. And it reminded me of Dallas Willard, who is my, one of my favorite authors, you know, book renovation of the heart. And this is what, this is what the spirit of God is up to. Just trying to renovate the heart. Um, you know, and I, I'm just more curious, I think not necessarily on what we do, um, but why we do it. Mm. Like why, why, why do I need to binge watch Netflix? And just, what am I, what am I escaping? Like, what am I, what am I, what's causing me to go there? Um, that's, that's wanting me to turn it all off. Um, and sometimes it's a survival technique. Sometimes it's literally just like, I don't know how to process my sadness and my disappointment. And that's where you go back, Peter, and you ask us such a great question, and you're really good at this. But like, if I if I fast forward my inability to process my sadness or my disappointment or to handle my stress well, it's it's all it's going to do is it's going to keep me stuck. And in the in the beautiful narrative of the scriptures, this is what the desert or the wilderness was, forty years. And they just roamed around in circles, 
because they didn't learn what they needed to learn. So they were stuck in a season instead of being able to step into what God had in store for them. And I, I, I think for me, realizing that there are areas in my life that I have not had the ability to deal with. I'll tell you the story. I write this in the book, but I came home one day and there was a staff member who just, who reminded me of somebody who had really hurt me. And I'm looking for a little spousal support from my wife to have my back. A little, a little like, you know, subversive gossip, but she could like, it's okay because we're, we're like in the, in the confines of our house and obviously being sarcastic. But like, I was looking for that. And she looks at me and she goes, isn't God so kind? I'm like, what do you mean God's so kind? This person's a jerk. She's like, God's so kind. I'm like, stop saying that. Why is God so kind? Well, he's so kind because he keeps bringing people into your life who remind you of this certain person who deeply wounded you. And for so many years, you just haven't had the courage to get after that. And so he so kindly keeps bringing people into your life until you finally have the courage to honor that truth. And that, that, re that shook me because I realized like, oh man, I've been using people or using experiences as an excuse to validate what I wanted to do all along instead of becoming curious as to why I wanted that in the first place. So here's the question. If you're listening and you've made it this far and you don't think I'm that crazy and so you're still listening for one more point, think about this. You do what you want to do. You do what you want to do. The bigger question though is, why did you want it? That's the question. Why did you want it? So for instance, I'm a pastor, but like I screw up all the time. Sometimes I create drama with my wife so I can create distance with her so that I can go do the thing I want to do, which is buy a pair of sneakers. It's not the smartest thing to do, but I did what I wanted to do. And it's not until I step back and go, Hey, why did you create that tension with your wife? Oh, cause I wanted space. Cause I knew I didn't want to have to ask her, can I go buy those pair of sneakers or have to admit that I wanted validation for my hideout. This is the stuff that if you fast forward that five years, sneakers become something else. It just keeps getting bigger and bigger. So why did you want that thing? Because we're going to do what we want to do. I don't know if that helps, but that, that's for me has been that curiosity, not shame, but curiosity and watching how God just brings to mind those triggers, those wounds, but also brings to mind what is possible through his love, his grace, and his truth. Mm -hmm. Man, uh, that's really good. We, Pete, Peter, I'm sorry. Oh, uh, are people allowed to binge watch, binge listen to Why Guy Why podcast? Um, according to Steve, that's a healthy thing. Is that, is well, that a, high a healthy escape? According okay. according to Steve, though, you have to ask why, and I'm not saying that jokingly. Why are you binge watching? <laughs> so I don't I don't want to get in trouble. So. You know, we always close with this question. So the good news is Aaron and I will answer it first. Um, and then Steve, you get the last word. But, you know, what does Jesus have to say about this topic? So, um, Aaron, why don't you start us? Oh, all right. Well, um, first of all, thank you, Steve. I really, we, this has been a, a great uh, conversation and really a lot to think about. Um, lot, when I know when I listen to this again, um, when it uh, comes out, it's there's going to be a lot to chew on there. So, um, and also thanks for reminding me about uh, In and Out Burgers. That made me really happy to think about it again too. So, uh, <laughs> um, we'll have to get your tips at one point about where where else to go around the country, but for good burgers, um, I do think this is a this is a great conversation, and um, I, I do think it's something that I mean the whole reason that. Uh, Jesus came was so that we uh, we can be freed from our sin. We can be free from the things that we hate that we do, that we don't want to do. I mean, the, what you mentioned, the uh, passage where Paul wrestles with that. Um, and yeah, I think that this is, this is a key to, um, it's a key to our, our, our spirits. It's a key to who we are. Um, and if we could get our minds around this, get our hearts around this, and, and not just through words, but through actions, then I think um, 
it would help all of us, which all together helps helps the whole everyone around us, the whole community. But um, yeah, I really I just think this is uh, near and dear to um, Christ wants us to be free. I mean, at the end of the day, that's what he wants. He wants us to be free. He wants us to be part of his family. So, um, yeah, thanks for uh, I really uh, thanks for thanks for pressing on this, uh, Steve. And and uh, yeah, we'll have to check out the thing beneath the thing for sure. Thanks, Aaron. Yeah, um, we're going to tell all of our listeners to buy the book. So by the time this comes out in September, um, so as we're closing this, I'm. You know, you mentioned John Ortberg, and John Ortberg has had um, some influence on my life. And one of the biggest things is he talks about shadow missions. And I just can't get that out of my head because Jesus, you know, we sometimes think about the things that get us 45 degrees off. Um, But I think what you're pointing at and what Jesus is pointing at is he's more concerned about the things that take us 5% off. So if you're not a Christian, you're saying, I want to live a fulfilled life you know, uh, meaningful life. And and Jesus says, just as Aaron said, I want to live my life more abundantly, but we have the shadow mission. And, you know, it's something that takes us 5% off. And, you know, my wife and I were just talking about this last night. Um, for the first time since having a smartphone, I turned off the notifications for my email. And for the first time wow. si- since like starting here at Browncroft, I left my laptop at home. And what I'm challenged by with this conversation is it took me like two to three years to do that. And it's this shadow mission of, I don't wanna be seen as um, not productive. I don't wanna be seen as non-responsive. I don't wanna be seen as someone not representing Jesus well. And I, I think about just that five degrees and just that one practice and just that one thing beneath the thing and I'm just challenging our listeners that when you really take the time to do this work and you're, you know, if I went to email anonymous and say, hi, I'm Peter, I have a problem with emails. They're like whack-a-mole, I just want them gone and out of the way. Um, I'd only be there for like a day or, you know, I, I've been clean for a week. But I, uh, in all honesty, there's some other things that are happening that when you identify not just how you're 45 degrees off, but how you're five degrees off. I think that opens the door for God to do a little bit more in you that's underneath. So Steve, if we had some heresy or something, you can clean it up. But uh, no matter what, what does Jesus have to say about this topic? How would you close us out? Well, I would just say, I really appreciate what you just did right there. Cause I, I think um, that's, that's so beautiful. You know, and I, I would, I would say me too. I mean, I struggle with that. Um, the need to be needed is, is, is for me, you know, like, and so, um, when you get an email, you get a little, uh, dopamine hit, you know, like someone needs me, you know, like someone, someone wants my thoughts, you know, you, you, but then all of a sudden it takes you away from your first, uh, responsibility for me being my family. So, um, it's a beautiful practice of putting into play. I want to be this kind of person long term, and so a consent, uh, coming to a limit, and actually doing that. Um, and so I think you know, there's two visions that you see in one verse, John ten ten. It's two visions. I've I've come that they may have life and have it to the full, and the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But two visions, and Jesus says, Hey, this is what I'm offering you. I want you to have life to the full. And I think sometimes, you know, in Dallas Willard language, um, we think it's like, should be really easy. Um, But I'll tell you that in what Dallas would say is grace is opposed to earning, but grace is never opposed to effort. So it takes effort to say, I don't, don't, I'm going to, I'm going to turn the notifications off. Mm -hmm. And then it it takes effort to say, I'm going to leave my laptop at home. It takes effort to say, for me, Steve, you're done at 430. And you you are gonna you are gonna go after that codependent need to be needed adrenaline high that you get not from God's spirit and not from who He created you to be and not from your family, but from somebody in Tuscaloosa, Alabama, who's messaged you on Facebook. That just that doesn't feel right. So I think I think for 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 me I would say just because God offers you and Andrew you said it so beautifully this this life of freedom. 
it also takes effort. And that's not in opposition to grace. It's us letting the truth of that freedom, that love, that peace, that grace that Christ offers us get into every atom, molecule, and ounce of our being. And I really believe um, if you do it in five years, you're going to be healthier Hmm. and you're going to be more whole. And truly, you're going to be more holy. Um, And it's just a better way to live. That's, that's, that's probably the best thing I can say. It's just, um, and I really appreciate though, that, that idea, Peter, it's just like, yeah, we all have these areas and it's like, um, workaholism will get like celebrated. I'm not saying that for you. I'm just saying like, that's like, can get celebrated, um, in my, in my family. Um, but deep down, it doesn't make me a person that's about mm-hmm. the kingdom work. It makes it about my kingdom. Well, folks, um, I, I can't encourage you enough. I'm going to be buying this book. I'm going to be reading, probably underlining and sharing on uh, Instagram um, and all over the place. We want you to buy The Thing Beneath the Thing. I think it's great for a small group. I'd encourage you to buy three or four and you know read it with your spouse. You can find uh, Steve. I think it's steveryancarter.com. Did I get that right? Um, yep. Just to make sure you look for the Ryan. Um, we're going to be tagging him in the post. Uh, this is coming out in September. Um, so we're just so thankful. Whatever you do, make sure you go to whygotwhypodcast.com. Make sure you subscribe there. Follow Steve. Follow us. Uh, we'll have this all. Steve, thanks so much for being here and just uh, being real and honest. We appreciate that. Hey, appreciate you guys. Love what you guys are about. And uh, continue to keep doing so much good in, at Browncroft and making a, a huge difference. Thanks, Steve. Well, folks, have a great day. Thank you.